bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome in to the Bet the Board podcast, NFL Week 5. We are past the first quarter, at least theoretically, of the season. All teams with four games in the win or loss column, as the case may be, as teams are beginning to show their true colors. I am your host, Todd Furman, joined, as always, by my esteemed colleague and co-host, the one, the only, Payne Insider. And Payne, how are you doing this fine Thursday, my friend? That was a, a built-up welcome. It seemed like you'd gotten out of the gates a little quickly there. You were holding back, and the welcome came with some vigor there. You know, every now and again, you have to try and mix up your inflection, your intonation, and your voice. Try and catch those listeners off guard and drive oh, a little monotone. bit of energy and excitement to get this thing going. We obviously have plenty of big games to get to, as we always do, but we saw something rather unique on Monday Night Football, and I don't mean that in a positive positive manner wanted to get your two-minute review of what we have seen transpire with this Giants offense so far this season why did you say that with a chuckle because I feel like you're setting me up for something here. I'm not setting you up for anything you here. are <laughs> I'm not setting you up for anything here I don't throw curveballs I'm out here throwing 105 miles an hour trying to paint the black that's what I do I don't have off speed stuff I don't throw breaking balls there's no ghost fork balls or anything else to get yourself in the MLB playoff mindset it's not good obviously and I think it's all around. You can't pass protect. It is ugly. Andrew Thomas hopefully returning soon. Saquon Barkley hopefully returning to soon. Daniel Jones is obviously quite rattled. And all of the sophisticated things that were done last season to kind of get a poor offense to function respectively, everyone's kind of prepared for now. And so what is the next wrinkle? What's the next step? And unfortunately, Brian Dayball and Mike Kafka haven't figured out what that is yet. And it's leading to an offense that's dead last in EPA per play. It's leading to an offense that's successful in 39% of its snaps. And some of the things you have to question. Um I mean, I thought we were going to lose the Matthew Breida prop just because he was going to go for, for 22 carries at 2.2 yards a clip. I and mean, what are we doing with that situation? Look, I mean, you, how many times you don't have can to be you run Matthew Breida over, into a wall? You don't have to be un- inefficient to go over low rushing totals. We've learned that <laughs> in the NFL in the past. So I just I, I can't envision that your game plan was going to be Matthew Breida touching the ball, what, nearly 20 times? I, I just Waller was on a milk carton. I just don't know what's going on there offensively. And again, I understand there's only so much you can call with that offensive line, but it's, it's ugly right now. Daniel Jones, certainly not running as much as he was last season. I have no idea what we're seeing. And I think there has to be some level of, of change. And then there's been some internal discussions of, of who's calling the plays. Are there interchanging play calls? I just 11 days off against a defense that by no means is is excellent that can't be what you put on display and the craziest part about it if you watch that game in its entirety uh, this obviously goes for our listeners the Giants defense had been their Achilles heel early in the season that unit gave them plenty of opportunities to stay in the game if the offense was able to mount a drive I mean at one point it's 14-3 the Giants are going in to make it a one score game and the pick six was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back so be interesting to see for the Giants because you can need a little bit more firepower because I'm not sure the defense against an ornery Miami Dolphins team this upcoming weekend is going to be able to keep the dam from completely bursting but Giants and Wink Dolphins- did a good job by the way he did that's what, threw that's some what curve balls. He threw the off-speed pitch. He took the 11 days of scout and be like, hey, you know, I probably shouldn't send blitz here every single freaking down. And 
I understand Geno Smith was dinged up a little bit, but I thought he did a good job being able to to stop the run. Guys got some pressure, and and that's quietly that you know, Thibodeau's coming on. Some of those guys up front are, are, are getting after the quarterback a little bit, and that was a, a really good defensive effort because Wink took the eleven days and and threw a little bit of a curveball there and didn't send as much pressure. Like an old school Charlie Huff, if you don't have the fastball to get out Major League Baseball hitters on a regular basis, you switch to the knuckleball and you get it done. Giants defense played well, the offense let them down, and here we are uh, with an interesting spot for two teams we saw on that short week. All right, Thursday night football, talking about short weeks, we get a battle up for the ages, Payne. The Bears and the Commanders renewing acquaintances for the second time in as many seasons. And when you look at the matchup they put on the books last year, it was arguably one of the league's ugliest games of the entire season. It was just one of nine games that have 19 or fewer points combined last season in that 12-7 barn burner where Washington comes up with the goal line stand. You're looking at the Commanders, a six-point favorite in this game, total painted 44.5 across the board. And as we try and figure out what the Bears are, we know it's a team mired in being miserable right now. 14-game losing streak, the longest in team history and longest active streak in the league. They've now allowed 25-plus points in 14 consecutive games, the longest streak in NFL history. And if things weren't bad, they got even worse over the weekend, blowing a 21-point lead against the Broncos on Sunday, which was tied for the largest blown lead in franchise history. Normally, there's a saving grace at the betting window when teams are performing this poorly. Not for the Bears. They're 2-11-1 ATS during this 14-game span, and they have not started 0-5 since 1997. Meanwhile, the Commanders come in on a short week, an emotional game last Sunday against the Eagles. They score as time expires to force overtime, but aren't able to get the victory. We've seen flashes from Sam Howell in this offense, a defense that, quite frankly, in my opinion, has underachieved thus far, given some of the star power. But when you're looking to handicap a game, on a short week with these two teams, what's the one matchup that catches your eye and will determine how this game gets decided, whether it's the side or the total? Well, you can see the battle in the market, right? I mean, we have seen under money initially, and then once it got to the key of 44, some over money. We have seen this open five, five and a half some places. The commanders got bet immediately as soon as we got to seven, seven and a half buyback. So there's a lot of price shopping going on out there. I think if you're a Bears fan, it's going to be tough to say this, but I would say baby steps, right? It's very possible Rock Bottom was hit last week, but there is one direction to go. And there were some positives, and I understand some of those offensive positives came against the Broncos defense that's dead last in the NFL, but I thought Justin Fields looked competent. Still held on to the ball a little too long for me, but that was Justin Fields' best passing game of his career. If you look at his completion percentage, 18% over expectation. There were 39 quarterbacks that took a snap last week. Fields was seventh best in adjusted EPA per play. He got back to pushing the ball down the field. Nine completions of 10 plus air yards. That was the most of his career. And then you think about the offensive line a little bit here, Todd. Darnell Wright at, at right tackle continues to look pretty solid. Got Nate Davis back from a family matter. Looked serviceable last week. All signs are pointing towards the return of Tevin Jenkins tonight. And I understand the commander's defense is, is certainly stepping down in class. They face the second toughest schedule of offenses to date. And now you get the Bears a little bit of a, a reprieve. But the commanders are middling in pressure rate. And you can hit some explosives on that commander's secondary. That's kind of where them not meeting expectations is mostly resided. Um, they're 24th in EPA per pass allowed, 23rd in defensive pass efficiency. So if you can give Justin Fields a little bit more time and he's back to pushing the ball a little bit further down the field with those receivers, you might be able to hit an explosive or two. But but ultimately, this comes down to price. And, and again, anytime a seven or better has shown itself, the Bears get bought. And I know it's ugly, and you probably would have hoped for a better injury report because the Bears, unfortunately, are without Eddie Jackson and Jalen Johnson again tonight in the secondary. But I think the thesis here is is pretty simple, right? Like, clearly the Bears haven't played to their preseason seven and a half win total projection, right? We can all say that. And clearly the Cardinals have exceeded expectation to this point. The command, the commanders, but, you mean, not the Cardinals, right? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Listen, the Cardinals have exceeded expectation to this point, but within basically a span of seven, you know, four weeks, the Bears are catching almost the same seven at some point that Arizona was in the opener, right? And so, ah, good point. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure laying points 
is the role you want for the commanders, right? Especially with with the mindset of their head coach. Um, again, I go back to whoever nicknamed Ron Rivera Riverboat probably was was on some good shit. Um, and especially you think about what you mentioned at the top, right? Those high leverage plays in a division game that that ultimately went overtime against the Eagles last week, and now you're circling back on a short week. That's that's a tough spot for the commanders, right? We, we talk about roles all the time. And and certainly, you know, the commanders catching points, the way they play, you know, decent front defensively, a little bit more of a conservative offense, sometimes liking to run the ball like it bodes better as a dog than it is when you're when you're laying points like this. So for me, at six, a little bit of a stay away. It'll be interesting, Todd, here to kind of see how the books manage this market, right? Like if books need a little little money from time to time i think some sevens get flashed from here until kickoff i just don't know if they they last all that long i can tell you from the couple of books that i've spoken to this game will start a waterfall effect going into the weekend because when you look at the commanders as a six point home favorite here they know that you're going to get money line liability you're going to have a lot of teasers over the weekend keyed into the home favorite so it'll be interesting to your point if they're looking to try and flash that out there to attract a little bit more of an appetite uh for the chicago bears uh going back to your point about Riverboat Ron, honestly, it's what I think of in all the mob movies out there, how the fattest guys that are made men are called tiny. That's why Riverboat Ron got his name, because he's about as buttoned up and conservative as there is when it comes to fourth and short situations and some of those other decision-making principles. I get you're at home. I get it's a division game. Philadelphia is reeling. I'm not sure how I felt about them deciding to kick the extra point, but that's a different discussion. Yeah. For a different, uh, sorry, I, you're on the road. You're not at home. I take that back. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I was like, you got to go for two here. You, you got them reeling a little bit. Now, I will say like last year they went in there and, and, and beat the Eagles outright. And so it was a little bit of a, a matchup that they've had some good familiarity with, and they seem to play those guys a little bit tougher. But uh, and you fell on the, on the short end of that. And this is certainly a, a big swing game, right? You can go to three and two, or you go to two and three. It's a, it's a massive difference. But I just I don't think you want to necessarily get in the habit of of laying points with with teams like the commanders um they can go out there and cover tonight like the bears could be that that large of an abortion right they, they could turn the ball over and set up some short fields and and certainly their defense is is a sieve and it'll be you know a nice breath of fresh air for for sam howell um and the one one defense that he did face kind of in this tier the final two and a half quarters the commanders went up and down the field on the Denver Broncos in mile high. So yep. you do have some data points that are at least, you know, from the perspective of the commanders, right? This is this is a tier of defenses we've we've dominated before. This is a class of offenses that we haven't been fortunate enough to play yet, right? Because we've played the second toughest schedule of offenses. So from that perspective, I, I totally get why there was a move on Washington. I just think this battle in the market is going to continue and that, you know, if we do see some sevens, they probably won't last overly long long makes a ton of sense sometimes these battles are always interesting to see how they unfold obviously both these teams have played the Denver Broncos the commanders winning by the slimmest of margins and the Bears coughing up that three touchdown lead that we mentioned from Thursday night football into Sunday and things will kick off early in the morning out here on the west coast and early on the east coast as well as we have our second installment of the London games Buffalo, the de facto home team against the Jacksonville Jaguars, who become the first team in NFL history to play back-to-back games overseas. And you're looking at Buffalo, a five-and-a-half point favorite. There are a couple of sixes if you shop around in the market. Total on the game, 48-and-a-half. And the Bills will make their first trip to London since 2015. It is a different venue. Last week's game between the Jaguars and Falcons took place at Wembley Stadium. This one will be at Tottenham's shop playing on turf. And some interesting comments from Trevor Lawrence saying that he prefers turf playing in London to the grass because it's obviously cut a little bit differently. And you're talking about soccer players in the 180 to 190 range instead of 300 pounders tearing things up. So we'll see if footing is a little bit better. But the other interesting comment out of Jags camp from Trevor Lawrence And I'll quote him directly. We're going to obviously be well-rested, adapted to the time change, because that is a real thing. You're on a big time change. It's a long travel day. I'm not sure exactly what their travel plans are. They, of course, being the Bills. If they're coming out for the week, kind of like we usually do, which is Thursday, get here Friday morning. The first three days here, I think, are hard. Jaguars receiver Calvin Ridley added. Your 
body is just all over the place. I feel like we're here now. We're ready for this next week. So you wonder if the Jags do have a little bit of advantage since teams aren't operating on a level playing field. When we look at the Jags, 8-6 and six, the last 14 games. They've been an underdog since the start of last season. It's the most wins in the NFL in that role, including the playoffs. And the Bills... They come in 19th team in NFL history to win three straight games by 28 plus points, three straight games with 37 plus points, one shy of tying a franchise record set in 2004. Paying the Bills offense is humming over the last three weeks. They do lose a key cog in their defensive backfield in Tredevious White. When we look at Jacksonville, you highlighted some of the concerns that we'd seen in short yardage situations. Third down efficiency was a little better last week against the Falcons, but still not great. When you start to handicap this game, fascinating with the star power, specifically at the quarterback position on both sides, but is there a particular matchup that you have your eyes on for the 930 kickoff from London, England. I think you hit it nicely there at the top in that we came out last week, talked about the Jaguars offense performing well on early downs through three games and their struggle was late downs and that, you know, those variance downs tend to even out and eventually that would regress positively. It did somewhat. I mean, the Jaguars had a 47% success rate on late downs against Atlanta. It's a Falcons defense that we think is improved year over year, but even with that improvement, it still doesn't look perfect, right? It doesn't look how last season ended. The Jaguars offense just kind of isn't humming right now. It's it's not operating on all cylinders. Depth at receiver being tested a little bit. Agnew is out. Zay Jones has missed time but did get in a limited practice on Wednesday. I think we have to monitor that because it's very clear at this point that third key cog is, is just so important to this Jaguar offense. And the way Buffalo is is getting pressure right and apparently von miller wants to play because he's never played in it you know a, a london game before it would make it a little more difficult right to take advantage of buffalo's cornerback situation with tredavious white out for the year if you don't have that third key cog there in, in, in zay jones now you look at the bills they're third in pass rush win rate they're number one in pressure rate they're 30th in blitz rate so buffalo's getting that natural pressure you die for as a defensive coordinator and sean mcdermott right now is been spades uh, on that side of the ball through through four weeks the positive for jacksonville here it it appears they're getting a massive piece back at left tackle with cam robinson now i know there's been some differing reports on if he'll immediately start there is he going to get mixed in you know i would think at this point when you're paying him the money you are He's had four weeks. The discussion was, you better be ready first game back. And all of a sudden, you're seeing Walker Little, who's filling in at left tackle, is now kind of getting some reps at left guard. It kind of insinuates that Cam Robinson's going to be returning to to left tackle. And I think what's interesting is that potentially upgrades two spots, Mm -hmm. is Walker Little has been playing fantastic at left tackle. So kicking him inside to guard and potentially upgrading that offensive line you pair him with Scherf and suddenly what was a monster weakness coming into the season with loads of question marks is is looking a little bit better against a a unit that you're going to need to be able to pass protect against I would expect Buffalo plays gobs of zone coverage to protect its its corner situation they're typically trending at like 76 percent zone uh, that was well above league average. My guess is without Tredavious White, you know, that ticks up. Calvin Ridley has kind of seen some some over-the-top help. Teams are trying to kind of remove him from the game. And with Zay Jones out, right, it's basically just Christian Kirk. I would think Kirk's probably in line for, for some targets, especially if Zay Jones doesn't return. The spot, to your point, though, is is not great for Buffalo. And it's not just the travel, right? I think the immediate thought perspective is like, you know, Buffalo to London I mean how difficult is that right it's like a seven hour trip but you're hearing the players talk about how big a factor it is especially players that have already gone through it you know just last week and gone through it multiple times because the Jaguars are out there all the time and they've kind of perfected that that travel trip Um, Jacksonville's offense obviously needs to play to last season's level its defense needs to hold relatively true i'm a little skeptical of the improvements if you've been watching quietly like jacksonville's churning out a top 10 defense and we didn't have a ton of hope for that coming into the season against the run their seventh in efficiency you have two key cogs on defense that are out devon hamilton and, and devon lloyd they 
did not travel to London. So they missed last week, but it's not a big deal against an Atlanta offense. You wonder if that that becomes a little bit of an issue in this spot. So somehow, I think if you want to stay within the six here, and again, a little bit of a battle on this one, and I, don't, I won't divulge too much, but obviously Billy, right, who's who joined us in, in week two and, and writes on the website, avid Buffalo guy, gets a ton of great intel there. He laid four at open. As soon as we got to six, there was some resistance. So again, like another game with a little bit of a, a battle and, and how you price in some of the travel situation and things of that nature. But I, I think not only do you need the Jacksonville offense to be a little bit better than we've seen so far, and your hope is that's the case with the offensive line help returning, but the defense has to play to, to somewhat of a, a true level here as they step up in class. It's such an interesting spot as well. You don't want to say Buffalo gets caught overlooking Jacksonville in any capacity, knowing that they play in primetime next week, albeit against an inferior foe in the Giants. But you wonder what that Miami game did potentially take out of the tank. Buffalo going out there and doing that in dominant fashion, making a statement why the road to the AFC East continues to run through Western New York until further notice. But should be a a fascinating game. And look, we used to joke all the time about these London games, knowing that we were going to have to watch the Jaguars in a standalone window when they were a completely irrelevant franchise. A much different dynamic in play these days with Trevor Lawrence at the helm than what we had seen in all of those previous seasons. You can. I mean, these are the these are the two favorites right now in their divisions yep no it's a it's a great game it's a good game think about all the times that we talked about oh well we're going to get a game in london with two teams with losing records i mean i know the jaguars are only 500 but they are still the favorite to your point to get out of the south even with the texans improve the colts and the titans playing well the jags know their margin for error may not be as wide as they once thought and if you want to be the best in a conference these are the kind of games you have to go out there and compete and put your best foot forward you can follow pain on x at pain insider i'm todd Furman. you can follow me there follow the podcast at bet the board pod and subscribe to the bet the board podcast newsletter absolutely free to your inbox every friday during the fall uh great information there reminders about the things you may have missed and most importantly an additional positive expectation prop bet for the liquid markets that are available to try and get your money in good each and every weekend throughout the fall raven steelers pain this is a matchup that we see seemingly well we do see it seemingly every year and twice a season in the division and they rarely disappoint even if offense can be hard to come by this is the 59th meeting all time between the ravens and steelers including the playoffs pittsburgh owns a 33 25 edge and the winner of this matchup will be in first place in the AFC North. Don't tell that to Steelers fans who had to suffer through multiple 23 plus point losses through the early going. The last six meetings between these teams have been decided by five points or fewer. It's tied for the fifth longest streak in any matchup in NFL history. They've played 22 games decided by five or fewer points since 2007. Seven more than any other matchup. The Bears and Lions, the next closest at 15. But the days of seeing the home team favored by three and allowing sports bettors to just battle it out in the market have long since stopped. The Steelers lost 30-6 to last week on the road at the Texans. It was their largest loss to a team with a losing record in 30 years but when they lost 27 and nothing to the Rams on September 12th 1993 game was so long ago Jerome Bettis wasn't playing for the Steelers then he was still a member of the Rams the Ravens they come into this contest fresh off a pasting of the Cleveland Browns their overall health seems to be trending in the right direction got some key cogs back at practice this week both on the offensive and defensive side of the ball From an offensive perspective, Lamar Jackson is playing his first game against the Steelers in 670 plus days. You look at Lamar Payne, and you talked about it in the preseason preview. He was going to benefit immensely with Todd Munkin as the offensive coordinator. And what has Lamar Jackson done? He's put up the second highest completion percentage in the NFL this season at 74.3. A significant upgrade year over year. We saw two rushing touchdowns last week. We saw two passing touchdowns. Much to our chagrin, the most improbable touchdown pass of the entire weekend to Mark Andrews at the end of the first half, according to Next Gen Stats. But when you look at this Ravens offense against a Steelers defense, this is no more like a steel curtain. It's played a lot more like a vinyl shower curtain so far this season. (laughs) You know, uh, this is one of those interesting games because... You know, over the years, Pittsburgh's defense has done a really good job containing Lamar Jackson and frustrating him and turning him over. And if you're back in the Steelers this week, I've dug. Your only handicap is history. 
right? Because there aren't a ton of supportive metrics and you're, you're hoping the spot and the history prevails and that Mike Tomlin has, has rallied the troops, right? And all those pound the table changes he discussed this week, there really hasn't been any other than more physical practices. So <laughs> I, I, I'm interested to see what this looks like. Lamar has played 19 Put teams in the NFL. Put those pads on on Wednesday, Payne. It's going to make you yeah. a better football team. Yep. Uh, yeah. Old school. Um, you know, you look, Lamar's played 19 teams in the NFL two or more times. Pittsburgh's obviously one of those 19 teams in the division. And Lamar has the worst rating against Pittsburgh from that 19 team grouping. Now, two things to me are, are, are very true here. And you kind of hinted at one. This is far and away the weakest version of the Steelers defense Lamar's faced. And this is the first time Pittsburgh's defense has faced Lamar Jackson with a wildly different scheme than what they've faced in the past. So if you look on early downs, the more predictive downs, Pittsburgh right now, just 15th in EPA per play allowed. They're allowing 53% of passes on early downs to great successful. You mentioned some of those injured players returning to Ravens practice. Left tackle Ronnie Stanley has returned. Starting center Tyler Linderbaum returned last week got his feet wet let's keep an eye on on right tackle morgan moses you some of the pass catchers rashad bateman practiced in full to start the week obj returned in a limited fashion i say that to say this because i think the biggest factor on this side of the ball is lamar having time right now the steelers are only 21st in pass rush win rate despite having you know an all-world edge rusher in tj watt baltimore i think finds success offensively in a new scheme that is surely going to have a wrinkle or two that Todd Munkin and Lamar Jackson have not unveiled yet. And if you look at the clean and pressure delta of both Lamar Jackson and the Pittsburgh Steelers defense, it is it is massive. Now, obviously, like when you go out there and say like, hey, like, you know, pressure helps the defense. It's obvious. But when you start to kind of figure out how large that dichotomy is, um, it is really huge for both of these these teams, right? When the Ravens keep Lamar Jackson comfortable, he's completing 83% of his passes. He's got an 85% adjusted accuracy rate from a clean pocket and a 112 passer rating. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at the second and fourth best marks in the NFL. When the Steelers don't get pressure, their bottom five in EPA per pass allowed, passing success rate allowed, passer rating allowed, and yards per attempt allowed. And so for me, Pittsburgh's defense has to somehow recreate the Monday night magic against the Browns where they force multiple turnovers. That was a game where, you know, faced another mobile quarterback with the team that could run the ball a little bit, and the Steelers gave up over 400 yards. They just survived on on two defensive scores. They're really missing Cam Hayward in the middle. I know he's getting up there in age, but still very good, you know, first ballot Hall of Famer, and, and they're missing his presence in the middle. Yeah, it's definitely been a problem. Look, uh, I mean, C.J. Stroud didn't get sacked once, and we thought going into the game last week that the Steelers could have an edge with their defensive line and ability to get pressure against a largely unsettled Texans offensive front. Couldn't have been further from the case in a game where the Steelers were dismantled, couldn't get anything going from their defense to spark the offense, and unfortunately the offense right now isn't operating like a well-oiled machine by any stretch of the imagination that it can mask some of those deficiencies. So as we switch our attention to the other side of the ball, the Steelers have 48 offensive points this season not including defensive scores it's the fewest through four games since 2001 they have a grand total of four offensive touchdowns compared to two defensive touchdowns they've gone three and out on nearly half their drives the highest rate in the nfl their 225 total yards and 111 passing yards in week four were both the fewest in a game since 2021 they've gone 52 straight games without reaching 400 plus total yards the longest streak by any team since the 2009 to 2013 arizona cardinals the only team's worst on a yards per play basis so far this season are the Giants and Texans and Payne to make things that much better Kenny Pickett wasn't good when he was 100% and now he's going to go out there and play through a knee injury that we thought early in the week could have potentially sidelined him for this game I mean based on the information we have it's it's a surprise Kenny Pickett's going to play Uh, all of the information we had even some of the you know the injury doctors right Deepak that we have on this show 
past injury doctors that we've had on the show all kind of lean towards Kenny Pickett not playing, but he shows up at yesterday's practice on Wednesday with this bulky knee brace. To me, if you watch the video, it is clear he has a limp, and that was just in a straight line jog. It's it's the lateral movements that are going to be restricted some, but you know Pickett says he's good, and, and that he'll be ready for Sunday. For me, there's not a massive difference between Pickett and Trubisky when both are healthy. And I know Pickett came on strong towards the end of last season, but if you look at 2022 in totality, there were 37 quarterbacks that had at least 200 dropbacks. Trubisky finished 19th in EPA plus completion percentage over expectation. Pickett was 24th. Now, I think we know what Trubisky's ceiling is. We're not quite sure of of Pickett's, and so that kind of makes these two more even. And then the tie goes to the younger kid. But then you look through four weeks this season so far, only Desmond Ritter, Aiden O'Connell, and Joe Burrow are worse than Kenny Pickett in EPA plus completion percentage over expectation. And it's very clear Trubisky is healthier. So like even if you had them on the same kind of playing field, right? Like you would think you would go with the healthier guy. And I'll just be candid. Like I was I was ready to fire up the Maserati here. Um, and if Mitch was going I know what the, the the trends have been, but like going over 37 and a half was was wildly appealing to me. Um, now, that's that's not the case with an injured quarterback. You know, um, the underdog in this series has has dominated. And I'm sure you've heard that that all over the Internet. But I think what's interesting is the larger the spread, the more dominance. Since 2008, there have been 21 games where the Ravens and Steelers has been lined three or more you would have lost money just once in those 21 situations taking the underdog. So I, I think, again, going back to my my point earlier is you're basically, if you're betting Pittsburgh, you're just, you're basing it on history. You're basing it on Tomlin's ability to have his teams fight in this spot, bounce back in this spot. It's difficult for me to back Matt Canada ever. I mean, he's just bottom of the barrel in terms of value over replacement in the offensive coordinator pool. And the Steelers' offense right now is only better than the Giants in EPA per play. Something we said a while back, I think it was prior to to the Raider game. I mean, Matt Canada's offense is terrible by design. He's got no feel as a play caller. He's extremely predictable. And it looks like the injury situation on this side of the ball past Kenny Pickett points in one direction as well. I mean, the Ravens will have Marcus Williams back in the secondary. And typically the Ravens don't rush players back, but Marlon Humphrey did get in and limited on Wednesday. So let's see what that looks like today. And then for the Steelers, they're already down Deontay Johnson. Now Fryermuth is out two to three weeks. And if you've watched the injury report, both starting guards, James Daniels and Isaiah Semaleo, are on their injury report, didn't practice Wednesday. So today is a massive day for both of those guys. I think that the sliver of hope for Pittsburgh's offense in this spot, right, is the idea that the Ravens defense is a bit phony relative to their metrics. And I can understand that just based upon who they've played. It's been a very easy schedule of offenses. You had a rookie QB making his NFL debut on the road in weather week one. You got the 26th ranked Bengals offense led by an injured Joe Burrow week two backup quarterback in weather week three rookie backup quarterback in DTR week four. And now right either an injured or backup quarterback in week five. And you know, to me, Pittsburgh just hasn't shown to be an offense good enough to normalize Baltimore's defensive metrics. But there's going to be some regression for Baltimore's defense at some point soon. Maybe it's here. Why I'm struggling with this game, Todd, is like a lot of the two-minute handicap stuff that's been very profitable through four weeks so far would lead you to just take the points in the series, right? Lean on Tomlin historically showing well in these spots the problem is for me like the points are no bargain like right now we have baltimore power rated seventh right not going to divulge the exact order here for obvious reasons but like the usual suspects are higher than baltimore right it's in some order the bills eagles 49ers dolphins chiefs cowboys and then the ravens we have the ravens about three and a half points better than an average football team Pittsburgh, on the other hand, and tell me if we're way off here, three and a half points worse than an average football team because their priors were average. They've stunk through four data points. They've got a couple guys injured, but basically Pittsburgh is sitting in the tier of like Colts, Texans, Falcons. So we're talking about a seven point spread and a neutral factor and a home field advantage. Like we're just not stealing anything at plus four here, especially when you're deciding to trot out a, a less than 100% quarterback. 
No, exactly. I mean, this is a game that was moving early in the week and you had an opportunity for a cheap buy to grab six, a much different handicap. Although as we sit here and break this game down now, a couple of shops have drifted out to four and a half. So I'm very curious to see where this market settles, what the situation looks like with Kenny Pickett. But to your point, I think at this point, you'd much rather have 100% Mitchell Trubisky than Kenny Pickett operating at 60% without some of the weapons behind a makeshift offensive line uh, that really hasn't done a great job to protect him. But Kenny Bear some of that responsibility as well hasn't gone through his progressions and somewhere along the way the Steelers have to figure out we know Matt Canada is a major problem make the change give Kenny Pickett a chance and if Kenny Pickett continues to struggle then you may have to go out there and try and identify the next franchise quarterback if the Pittsburgh kid cannot be that guy but to your point history sides with Pittsburgh here and then bouncing back after embarrassment the previous week whether it's hook by hook or by crook special teams defense they find a way to manufacture points they've just done it so many times in the past into the late afternoon with Philadelphia traveling across the country to take on the Rams and when we look at this game it's Philadelphia installed as a road favorite here four and a half point chalk this totals moved only one direction open as low as 46 and a half 47 we're up a full field goal out to 50 and a half Philadelphia can become the first Super Bowl loser since the Bills back in 1991 to start five and oh the following season they're 11 and 1 in their last 12 road games. The only loss over that span came in Dallas when it was Gardner Minshew under center, knowing that Jalen Hurts was dealing with an injury. Meanwhile, on the flip side, when we look at Matthew Stafford and the Rams team, Stafford's been excellent to start, but odds makers seem to have a pretty good grasp on when Stafford will play well versus when he'll struggle. Just 1 in 10 straight up, 3 7 and 1 ATS in the last 11 games he started as a home underdog. Payne, this game is fascinating for a variety of reasons because when we look at Philadelphia, Philadelphia, we had concerns about how this team would look replacing coordinators. Early on in the year, Brian Johnson has, hasn't has quite allowed this offer, offense to operate with the same ruthless efficiency we saw with Shane Steichen. We know the competition was going to get better, but I think what's getting overlooked as well is what we're not seeing from this team defensively. Jonathan Gannon getting Arizona to play their balls off every single week, and the Eagles aren't generating pressure at the same rate. We know the secondary is down a couple of guys, most notably at the slot corner position, but they're giving up chunk passing yards and last week against Washington they couldn't get off the field on third and intermediate situations so so many fascinating situations here including the fact that the Rams while playing at home this week in my opinion are at the travel disadvantage given that they logged more than 8,500 miles traveling across the country on short weeks twice to the eastern time zone to play the Bengals on a Monday night to follow it up with a hard fought four quarters plus game against the Colts where Matthew Stafford said that his hip was basically shutting down and his muscle was spasming as he gutted that team to a 29-23 win. So, so many conflicting factors when we look at these two teams versus what the market thought they'd be early in the season compared to how they've performed in relevant data points thus far. This, to me, might be the most interesting game of the entire weekend. Just based upon (laughs) everything you're seeing in the market, you're hearing from betters, a little bit of a battle here. And the conflicting ideas of of what these two teams are. And I think, you know, you can cherry pick a metric or two that makes you feel good about the Rams defense. And, and, you know, no doubt, I think Raheem Morris has done a nice job early in the season being creative. Guys are playing extremely hard. But there's like only so much you can do schematically. And trying hard should be the standard. And for me, like there's just not a lot of talent on the Rams defense past Aaron Donald. So, you know, for as much as the Rams defense has maybe exceeded early season expectations in a few categories, they're still 24th in schedule adjusted efficiency, 28th in early down EPA allowed, which is the the really predictive metric. And I, you know, I think you hit it perfect with Brian Johnson. I think we kind of all are, are cognizant that the Eagles offense hasn't looked perfect. It's just not in that that fine rhythm Johnson's kind of still finding his vibe as a play caller right how to kind of stagger plays how to set up a play in the first quarter that you come back to in the third quarter all of those things aren't aren't perfect um and 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 I think what's interesting here is you know if you are a a multi-step level thinker you're going to maybe gravitate towards the familiarity factor where just last week Raheem Morris and the Rams we're able to face a Shane Steichen offense and a mobile quarterback and hold them to zero for two and a half quarters. And then this week, the Rams get Shane Steichen's old offense and his old mobile quarterback. And 
I think that's causing some of this sharp money in the market. The other side of the coin is the Eagles and Jalen Hurts are now going to know how to counter everything Raheem Morris did to stifle the Colts offense early. And and once that cat's out of the bag, you know, hey, when we're in this formation, this is what the Colts did last week against this exact formation. Now, all of a sudden, we have a week to figure out the counter to that. It, it, I don't know if that's quite a thing, right? And, you know, my point in bringing that up is like for this game to follow the shape of the betting market, which from Sunday night until we record this at, you know, 7 a.m. Vegas time, it's it's Rams and over. Right, market open Ram six, we're as low as four now. Market opened as low as forty six and a half on the total peak right now, fifty one. For those two moves to unfold, it comes down to Sean McVay, Matthew Stafford, and the Rams offense to me. And yes, like Stafford looks really good. And Puka and Tutu are playing awesome. The Rams are hovering around being a top ten offense and schedule just efficiency, and now Cooper Cup potentially returns. Let's see if that actually unfolds. Cup got a limited practice in Wednesday, I assume. The goal is to ramp him up later today to see how the hamstring responds Friday. And if all is well, then you'll probably see him out there. But there is this narrative, and to some extent it's true, right, that the Eagles' defense can't stop the pass. And and listen, this is, this is coming from a guy who told you the Eagles' defense would regress this offseason. But you look through four data points. If you remove garbage time, which is typically where the Vikings feast, and that is a team the Eagles played, the Eagles' defense is fifth and drop back EPA allowed. When you adjust for schedule, it's a middling pass defense in terms of efficiency. And and Philly is absolutely susceptible over the middle with backup linebackers. I know N'Kobe Dean returned to some practice. He's working out on the sidelines. I don't think he's out there this week. And then you have a brand new batch of safeties, some question marks with your slot corner. So Philly is giving up basically over half an expected point anytime they face a pass over the middle of the field, and they've given up a 55% success rate. So there is this path for the Rams offense. But it's the counting stats that make the Eagles' pass defense look worse than it is, but they're facing a ton of volume, right? The Eagles are basically a pass funnel defense. They've faced the second most pass attempts on average per game this season. And so for me, like really the biggest question to the Rams success is exactly what you hit at the top. It's Matthew Stafford. He played Monday night against the Bengals, got the ever living shit kicked out of him. He was pressured on 50% of his dropbacks. He was sacked six times. The Rams decided to travel back to LA and then to Indianapolis. And that was a tough game for Stafford. He came out and said after the game that his leg was shutting down, <laughs> that he couldn't step and push off because of the hip injury. Incredible McVay comments. was asked about it. Incredible right? Mc- comments. McVeigh was asked and said, Stafford should be good. Right now, it looks like Stafford is, and we joked off air, is like being held together by, by double bubble and like a few old used rubber bands from the back of, of the desk drawer in your office. This game is 100% on the Rams passing game. So the question to me is like, can Matthew Stafford survive the game? And it looks like left tackle Lark Jackson is trending towards not playing again. The Eagles might not be accumulating the sacks, but they're eighth in pass rush win rate. They're top five in pressure rate. I'm just not sure Stafford survives. We'll see. And like, I understand the Rams move with how the Eagles have played with the perceived matchups on paper. I'm just starting to get that Eagles Buccaneers vibe from Monday Night Football all over again. And the same guys and groups that that bet the Buccaneers in that spot are the same guys feeding me the information again this week. And I'm just like, eh. and, and you kind of see anytime this gets to like four again, very much the same sentiment as that Bucks game. You start to see a little Eagles money into the market. I was hoping for three minus 20, like I may or may not have been promised, but I don't think the market is going to get there in any capacity for Philadelphia. But I think all the points that you bring up, you know, talking about the Eagles and how people fall in love with counting stats above all else, you have to put them in a little bit of context. The other thing, when we look at Philadelphia and you talked about the Rams having one truly plus plus elite defender in Aaron Donald, Philadelphia still has a pretty good offensive line that may have something to say about Aaron Donald disrupting things, giving Jalen Hurts time to operate from the pocket or using that quarterback run game to force Donald to defend the run and take him away from the pass rush. Speaking of somebody, battles, somebody said, by the way, enough is enough. Yeah. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of battles in 465, 466, it has been entertaining to watch. And you talk about fascinating games for all the wrong reasons. This one has all the makings of a car crash. We're not going to break down, but I will be watching 
to see exactly who wins that battle between the Bengals and Cardinals. Uh, into some a some game. steam there at two and a half. That was like, no, nah, <laughs> not anymore. No we soup for no. you. <laughs> two and a half is just ridiculous. When the look ahead was eight, someone finally dove in. Uh, we are now back to back to three on the Bengals. Very interesting game. All right, a game that everybody will be watching on Sunday Night Football, though a, a battle of titans in the NFC, and a game that could go a long way in determining who may ultimately be the number one seed in this conference getting a buy early on in the postseason that of course taking place in the bay area between the dallas cowboys and the san francisco 49ers it's the niners painted we'll call it a 3.75 using the asian handicap here there are plenty of fours out there if you like the dog plenty of three and a halfs out there if you happen to like the favorite total 45 there are a couple of 45 and a halfs as well the 49ers have beaten the cowboys in the playoffs each of the last two seasons 19 to 12 last year in brock purdy start in 23 17 but when dak prescott forgot how much time was left on the clock down there in jerry's world the 49ers can become the fifth team in the super bowl error to start 5-0 and with 30 points in each game. All four teams to accomplish this feat previously did not win the Super Bowl. Meanwhile, the Cowboys have two of the largest wins in the NFL this season by 40 at the Giants in week one, a 35-point victory last week against New England. And when we look at the Cowboys, for all the criticism that this team has had, they've actually been good when they're catching points under Mike McCarthy. 8-8 eight and eight straight up, but 10-6 and six ATS going back to the 2020 season. Tied for third best straight up underdog record during that span. The Cowboys have also done well when the lights are at their brightest. 10 and 2 ATS in primetime games since 2021, but they'll be walking into a juggernaut in their own right. The 49ers have been great in their own building. 13 and 2 ATS, the last 15 games that they have played in Santa Clara. Payne, this game is fascinating on both sides. (laughs) <laughs> fascinating on both sides of the ball. I'll let you take it where you will, whether it's with the 49ers offense against the Dallas Cowboys defense, known to create havoc short fields and sco- and defensive touchdowns, or with this 49ers defense that looks great on paper, has been outstanding so far, but are in to face their first true test when it comes to a living, breathing vertical passing attack this weekend. Biggest game of the week, the litmus test for both NFC contenders, we get it Sunday night in prime time, so we're going to deep dive the game both sides. I, let's just start with the Cowboys offense. And, and you know, we've talked about it not looking perfect. I don't love all of the short passes, and, and that's a little bit concerning. Only Bryce Young has a lower intended air yard average than Dak Prescott. And Dak is also QB 28 out of 35 qualifiers in the amount of 20-plus yard throws at just 8%. Maybe. We see a little bit of a tiny bump as as Brandon Cooks gets healthier, the offensive line gets healthier, but I think it's time to to open some things up. The Cowboys' red zone issues, that becomes front page news right now, it seems. Everyone's talking about it this week. If you look and dig into this, Dallas has run a league-high 85 snaps inside their opponent 20. That's a real positive. That's 31 more plays than the team with the second most red zone snaps. Unfortunately, the Cowboys are 30th in touchdown rate. Mike McCarthy has been too predictable. 80% of those first down red zone runs, uh, or plays rather, are runs, okay? And it also looks like Dallas is is missing Dalton Schultz in the red zone a little bit because they're using far less two tight end sets. And then one of the things in recent years, especially if you've watched Buffalo or the Giants, right, Brian Dayball specifically, unlocking the quarterback runs in the red zone it's a huge help to efficiency and i think you get dax legs moving a little bit there the final thing's pretty damn clear too like there's a mental hurdle i think of of tony pollard not being big enough and and that has to stop because rico dowdle isn't zeke elliott and pollard is plenty efficient in short yardage and and dowdle is not so hopefully we see some of those changes uh, the Cowboys analytics department has been delivered the goods to unlock that red zone efficiency this week. Let's see if they actually use it. The positive, I think, for the Cowboys offense in general, the underlying metrics have been better than the surface level ones. Aside from the Arizona game, Dallas has basically lived in garbage time. And if you strip that out, the Cowboys offense is sixth in EPA per play. They're third in passing success rate. 
It's actually the inverse for the 49ers defense. And if you go back to our our preseason preview, it was a unit that we thought would regress some based upon the report I was given before the start of the season that, that we shared. The 49ers have not been able to stop the run. 28th in EPA per rush allowed in non-garbage time. The 49ers have also faced the sixth easiest schedule of offenses. Josh Dobbs was able to find success through the air. 49% success rate last week. EPA would have been substantially higher if not for three drops, two of them which were were in the end zone. But still, Arizona's offense found some holes in the 49ers secondary. Again, one of those reports that I got was, hey, we really think only like one of our corners can truly cover and so you know we'll see it it looks like the Cowboys offense is getting healthier along the offensive line I think it's trending towards the starting five playing together for the first time all season the one guy that can cover for the 49ers at corner is Trevarius Ward he's dealing with a lingering heel issue you can tell it's not allowing him to play to peak mispractice on Wednesday I think he goes out there and battles Dre Greenlaw battling a lingering ankle injury from before the season let's see how effective he is as well so I think there's some some spots here for the Cowboys offense to to have some success and then when you look at the injury front kind of just trending in a little bit of a different direction not saying those 49er players miss but they're a little bit banged up Cowboys offensive line getting a little bit healthier we, we were help we were like hoping that that Brandon Cooks provided that compliment to Lamb he was kind of returning from an injury kind of working his way back he should be a little bit healthier in this spot as well Michael Gallup by the way welcome to the program back-to-back 60 plus yard games he apparently was the one that was spurred on by the Cowboys bringing in Brandon Cooks is emerging as the number two so we'll see maybe Cooks can uh, slot as that three and give them a couple of very useful components as we know Cooks has produced everywhere he's been uh, when we look on the other side of the ball, pain, Brock Purdy has obviously exceeded everyone's expectations. The fourth quarterback in NFL history to start his career 9-0 and or better, joining Ben Roethlisberger, Mike Tomzak, and Mike Livingston. Uh, when we look at what he's been able to accomplish, he's got the second highest passer rating in his first nine career starts all time behind a Hall of Famer, Kurt Warner. Last week against the Arizona Cardinals, he raised the bar himself. 20 of 21 passing, fourth highest completion percentage in a game in NFL history. And when we look at what he's been doing, those in-cutting routes, those mid-range completions, he's blowing some of these metrics off the charts. However, when we look at Purdy, the one game that he probably struggled the most came against this Cowboys defense last year in the playoffs, looked a little bit like a fish out of water in the first half, righted the ship in the second half, but he clearly has some weapons that he's been able to lean on. Christian McCaffrey doing all world things in terms of scoring touchdowns, providing that versatile threat as a runner and receiver. Brandon Ayuk, two 100-yard games, was tremendous last week as the 49ers went his direction, trying to keep the workload low for Debo Samuel, who's still dealing with a rib injury. And last year, the 49ers, when they played the Cowboys, look, the Cowboys' defense is vulnerable to a couple things. George Kittle took full advantage. But we look at the 49ers' offense against this Cowboys' defense, is there trust, faith, and confidence that this offensive line is ready for its biggest test of the season? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and both units are stepping up in class, right? I mean, you think about the, the Cowboys defense, right? They've exceeded expectation by a large mile in three or four games. But this isn't Daniel Jones, Zach Wilson, Mac Jones, or, or, or Dobbs. Also a massive step up in class for, for Brock Purdy and the 49ers offense as well. You think about who they've faced, the Cardinals. 30th in defensive efficiency Giants 27th Rams 24th and Pittsburgh is middling through four games Uh, I think we did have questions coming into the season about the 49ers offensive line and aside from Trent Williams those questions are are, are problems and I I think they get camouflaged a little bit by how good Kyle Shanahan is how good Brandon Ayuk is and kind of taking that next step as a wide receiver one and the things that Christian McCaffrey can do but you look at basically you know how Kyle Shanahan's had to go about camouflaging a weak offensive line it's been and this is why he's one of the best but the right side of that 49ers offensive line is a problem right guard Spencer Buford has not made that year two leap. He's grading out 92nd out of 94 guards in pass blocking. Starting right tackle Colton McKivitz. He's a career backup that is drafted to play guard. Okay. He's currently 58th among tackles in pass blocking. Starting center Jake Brandel, 37th out of 44 qualifying centers in pass blocking. Aaron Banks playing well below replacement level. Effectively, Trent Williams is propping up this entire 
offensive line for the 49ers and kind of giving you a different vibe of perception of what they actually are. I would envision this means Kittle is going to be needed more of a pass blocker this week. And and based on the matchup against the Cowboys front seven, right, they rank number one in pass rush win rate, number one in pressure rate at 55%. The crazy part about some of these struggles for the 49ers offensive line, when you think about them, it's like they faced the Cardinals defense 27th in pass rush win rate, the Steelers 21st, the Rams 19th, and the Giants, despite all of the incessant blitzing, is 23rd in pressure rate. If Debo looks like a shell of himself, that he was against Arizona battling through multiple injuries and Kittle spends more snaps and pass protection. Suddenly the 49ers throw game isn't as threatening and and you need Kittle to be a threat to the Cowboys defense. They have not faced a premium tight end so far this season and they've struggled defending that position. They're well below average in success rate and catch rate allowed to tight ends. But if Kittle's spending the day in pass protection, uh, it, it kind of negates that, that matchup advantage. Brock Purdy, hasn't looked nearly the same when pressured most quarterbacks don't but again his delta is much larger than most qb 26 out of 35 in adjusted accuracy when pressured 29th in turnover worthy plays 24th in pressure to sack rate this game is all about getting pressure on brock purdy making him uncomfortable because from a clean pocket you know purdy's been pretty deadly i don't know if 19 points is in the cards again but um I think the Cowboys defense absolutely has the ability to put together a a similar effort to that divisional round playoff game last January. Tell you one thing, reading comments and quotes leading up to this game, uh, I'm not one necessarily to buy into bluster and bravado, uh, but the Cowboys have had this game circled. They've talked about how important this contest is. So if they have anything in the chamber that they haven't shown through the first four games, they are going to empty it in this particular spot against the 49ers and heaven help them if they come up short and the 49ers don't put forth their A game the Cowboys may continue to be relegated to an afterthought in the NFC but this game no doubt about it will bear watching and will be a significantly more competitive Sunday night football game than what we'll anticipate a week from Sunday when Buffalo is a two touchdown favorite against those aforementioned New York Giants since we come full circle on this show like we do all the time you can follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Insider you can follow me there as well at Todd Furman follow the podcast at bet the board pod and while we remind all of you guys and girls to sign up for the bet the board podcast newsletter check out the college podcast as well I know some of you guys are NFL enthusiasts through and through but the college offers all sorts of great aspects that you can exploit in the betting market as well and if you're going to ride along with us for the full season best bets in the NFL and college play them all play them both and you'll find yourself in a very good state of affairs at the tail end of the season speaking of the best bet pain final thing and order of business that we need to get resolved on this show here where are we going this weekend I actually think you set that up well, and I know we mentioned it in passing on Monday, and we said we'd address it again here because this is the most listened to part of the NFL podcast, which is the best bet section. But one thing that we always talk about is sample size. It matters. And so whether you like college football or you don't, getting another plus EV investment into the portfolio matters. We'll never know from season to season whether it's college football that's running hot or the NFL that, that that's running hot. We just don't know, right? And so right now in, in college football, we're four and one on best bets. You sprinkle in Brad's best bet every week. He's four and two. So that podcast is is, is eight and three. This one, one and four. Obviously, you know, I think we continue to put you guys in a great spot. The Ravens, Browns total last week. Yeah, thank yeah, I don't you, know what to say the there, way. right? Thank like, you, by the way, for sending me that video yesterday. Just when I yeah. feel comfortable <laughs> and the wound has started to heal up with a 72-hour grace period, you send me that composite video that came from Next Gen Stats. And go, hey, watch this, and now we can finally put that first yeah. half total to bed. Lamar had three of the most unlikeliest uh, probabilities of completion on uh, – of the week and they were all on the one drive before halftime so uh including the touchdown so my point here is right when we give out a, a total in that game of under 20 it closes 18 and a half you see a quarterback get injured after the fact it's it's seven to three with you know eight minutes to go with the ravens backed up against the number one defense in the league and it requires like 285 plus yard drives that are just full with second and longs and, and third and medium pluses getting converted um over a short sample size 
that's where CLV matters. That's kind of how you can tell who has an edge and who doesn't, even though if you don't want to like hold on to the CLV trophy. And I understand that, but there's a lot of people giving out information in this space. They're just giving out picks. They're not actually betting the stuff. We're going to war with you guys every single time. We're probably betting large sums of money, larger than 99.9% of the listenership here. So we feel it. It was a great bet. We'll continue to make some great bets in, in, in my estimation, and uh, we'll see where the dust settles. My feeling is it'll be another winning season uh, among all of our best bets through college and NFL when, when the season concludes. Let's finish the diatribe up, but just wanted to put that out there because I know a lot of people are listening to it and you know some people say hey we don't address the losses we always do they're always just kind of in the flow of conversation on monday uh, and we usually bring up other games that we lost that you know no one would ever know um we also so, I mean, along those same mindset though for people that say we don't address the losses we're also not the kind of crowd that pounds our chest every time we win i mean our expectation is that we're going to win we do this for a living like you alluded to there so there's no need to go out there and scream it from the mountaintops it's like they say in sports when you win say little when you lose say less but i think sometimes people want to try and crow about the losses and they want to take credit for the wins so when it works on both ends of the spectrum i think to use this podcast as a vehicle and a teaching tool as is as valuable as anything else we've ever done as we continue to produce these things and go over what 600 plus episodes that we've put out in the last 10 years or so we are we are going to reach uh, the 600 episode mark here within the next couple of days might as well address that. Well, there'll be a contest for the 600th episode at some point. Maybe we divulge it next Wednesday on the College Football Podcast. But let's get the brass tacks here. Let's finish this. Let's where we ended. Sunday Night Football, the big game. Cowboys 49ers. Let's go with the Dallas Cowboys. Let's call it plus four minus 15. Pinnacle, you can get plus four minus 13. Caesars, Will Hill, uh, have that available, right? Forecast. A couple of, of the sharper shops have that. Um, it's certainly going to be slanted from the the public. Uh, are going to be all over the 49ers here. Maybe you end up getting a natural a natural four closer to kick. I'm not quite sure. I, I, I kind of get a vibe here. There could be an order coming in on the Cowboys. So let's just call this Cowboys plus four minus 115 as our as our best bet this week. Broke the game down earlier, right? It's time stamped. 10 minutes ago, we broke, broke down both sides of the ball. Probably spent 15 plus minutes on it. So you can kind of get our vibe there on the game. I don't need to rehash here. Nope, you don't. Uh, I lived through the handicap once, did the handicap with you, and uh, for those folks who happen to miss a key nugget or two, that's what the rewind button is there for on your favorite podcast platforms. All right, my friend, uh, another week of great college and pro football content in the rearview mirror. Now the only thing left to do is achieve those results over the weekend. Anything else you'd like to share with our loyal listeners before we reconvene on Monday with our recap show and an in-depth breakdown of what should be an intriguing Monday night football game as well between the Green Bay Packers and the Las Vegas Raiders no back on Monday hopefully with a bunch of winners added to the portfolio over the weekend so the name of the game and why we were in business to try and put more winners than losers on the ledger best of luck to all of you with wherever your investments take you across college pro and any other sporting endeavors this weekend come Sunday evening with a Dallas Cowboys plus four ticket in hand we'll see you at the window we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of bet the board make sure you follow todd and Payne on x todd is at todd Furman. that's t-o-d-d-f-u-h-r-m-a-n and Payne is at Payne insider that's p-a-y-n-e-i-n-s-i-d-e-r don't forget our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes and most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery, YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms. 